Very few people go into disability services because we want to be confronted with abuse. We don't want to believe that anyone we care about is experiencing abuse. It can be even harder to accept that someone we know and like could be a perpetrator. But every major study has found that people with disabilities are more likely to experience abuse than people without disabilities. Denying the problem won't make it go away. We all have to be proactive. Hi, my name is Meg Stone. I'm the director of Impactability. Impactability is a program that empowers people with disabilities and communities to prevent abuse. We do this by teaching people with disabilities the skills to protect and advocate for themselves, and also by working with organizations that serve people with disabilities to ensure that when people report abuse incidents, they're handled well, and also to prevent abuse. This is my colleague, Keith Jones. Um, he is a nationally recognized disability rights activist and speaker. Hello. I understand as a person with a disability how difficult it is to report abuse. Oftentimes when we do report, whether it be to our caseworker or our friends or our family, people often don't believe us. Because maybe because of our disability, we misunderstood what was happening. We didn't recognize that they were just being helpful. Sometimes it is very subtle and very hard to recognize. Oftentimes it's very obvious. But as a person with a disability, we want to be believed. And so when people don't believe us because of our disability, it makes reporting abuse that much more difficult. So in this video, we hope that when you see the scenarios, it will give you a chance to recognize the challenges we face in reporting abuse. Working with people with disabilities can be incredibly challenging and often underappreciated. And we know that for many people, it's the unique personal relationships that people develop with the folks that they care about that really makes our jobs fulfilling. In thinking about abuse prevention, we don't want to be overly cautious. We don't want to take the fun or the spontaneity out of the work that we do. But at the same time, we really want to realize that abuse is perpetrated in some of those close personal relationships that we so often value. So we have to be careful about what constitutes abuse and what it looks like in actuality. And as a provider and caregiver, we understand that it's difficult, but we also need to know how to recognize abuse when it happens. And the following scene will give you an example of what happens in a workplace setting. So what, so what did you guys do uh, this weekend? Oh, we went dancing and then we, uh, there was a big frisbee game. Oh yeah? But you you gotta you come dance? dancing with us. Do I dance? Well, you know. Everybody dances, man. Yeah, you have to Everybody come with does. us. Bill uh, is incredible. Oh really? She's, yeah. It's only because I got a good partner. Cool, maybe I'll do that. I think we got a new one. Cool. I think we got a new one, yeah. All right, score. <laughs> hey, Bill. All right, you guys, I'll see you right. later. See you later. Hey, Bill. Hey. Sam, what's up? Hey, That's buddy. the man who's going to cheer me up. I was so sad about the Red Sox losing again. I know. I know. It's ridiculous. It's it ridiculous. We're never going to be in the series this I year know. if they keep that up. But, you know, I got something special for you. Yeah. And this will make us all feel better. Okay. So if you just come with me, you're going to love this, man. All right. All right. See you later, Harry. So uh, just have a seat over here. Now, special job for you. You got to take the bottle caps. You got to screw them on the bottles, and you got to put the bottles in the bin. Okay. Got it? Got it. Bottle caps, bottles, okay. bin, boom. Can I get one question? Yes. Can you with my friends? I wish I could help you with that, but you have to understand this is a really important job, and it's really difficult for me to find someone who can do this, and I need you to be completely concentrated. I need you to focus on here, and this is a special job. I can't just get anyone to do it. So yeah, it's a really hard position for me, so you, you got to help me out here. Will you help me out? Okay. All right, cool. I'm going to be with you again in a minute, okay? okay? All right, cool. Great. See you in a bit. Hey, buddy. Hey. Working hard? Yeah. Yeah, I think you could put that down for a second. Let me help you out here. Does that feel good? You don't have to do that. Shh, shh, don't worry. This, this is what friends do for each other, Sam. And you're lucky here. You're so lucky. Do you think I do this for everyone? You're special. That feel good? Yeah? Yeah, yeah I'm glad. Please stop. Shh, shh, 
Don't worry. You don't have to be nervous. Please stop. Alright, so you know this is just between you and me, right? Alright, you're not going to tell anyone, right? Okay, great. I'll see you later, buddy. Alright, keep up the good work. Can I talk to you, Janelle? All right, let's talk. Let's let's go over here. Hey, Sam, what's going on? You seem upset. Yes. He went under my under my shirt and turned my shoulder. Who did? Bill. Bill from downstairs? Yes. When did this happen? This morning. Oh, my gosh. Did you ask him to stop? Yeah, I did tell him to stop. He won't stop. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry that happened to you, Sam. Are you okay? Yes. You did the right thing telling me, okay? So when somebody does something like that, when they touch you like that, that's abusive, okay? Yeah. So we have to call a place called the Disabled Persons Protection Commission, and they'll help us look into it and make sure that Bill doesn't touch you that way again. Is that all right? I won't get him fired. He's my friend. Yeah, I know. I know he seems like a friend, but a friend wouldn't touch you that way and make you feel uncomfortable, okay? I think it's really important that we call the DPPC so he doesn't hurt you again, okay? Do you want to make the call with me? Sure. Okay. Eat with me? Yeah, definitely. Awesome. What do you got today? Uh, just old pasta. What do you have? Mm, Chinese. Yum. Old Chinese. <laughs> I want to eat it. So how was your weekend? It was fine. But oh my god, did you hear about Bill? What? He got fired. I heard that he was touching somebody inappropriately. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. So what do you know about that? Look, I I feel like this is really inappropriate. I'm sorry. I just I don't want to talk about it, Danny. Come on. I really, come on. There must have been a miscommunication or something. We know Bill. He wouldn't do that. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about it. Maybe you should call Bill and ask him yourself. You're holding out on me here. You know, I, I really don't want to talk about this here. All right? Okay? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> In the scene, Sam was abused by someone he trusted in a place where he thought he was safe. But more importantly, he knew he had somewhere to go in order to report the abuse. As you can see, Bill the abuser was somebody who was well liked. It may be easier for us to assume that somebody who would perpetrate abuse wouldn't also be someone who was funny, who was really good at their job, who had great relationships with individuals with disabilities. But in reality, nobody could successfully perpetrate abuse unless they built up that kind of trust. So a lot of abusers are also people we like, people we respect. But what spoke really well of this agency is that even in this dynamic, Janelle was able to put Sam's safety first. She focused on what he needed, she believed what he said, and she took action. And what's also important is confidentiality was maintained. Janelle maintained Sam's confidentiality, even though it was a potential for becoming juicy off a scuttlebutt. But that is what was important, that Sam had his, her trust had somewhere to go, and that the appropriate measures were taken in order to address the situation. For most of us, when we hear an abuse report, it's gonna be difficult. And in those situations, we wanna to talk to somebody to get support for ourselves. What we wanna do is make sure we're talking to the right person within our organization, the person whose job it is to support us, or we're talking to somebody that the individual who made the report gave us permission to share the information with. We want to make sure that we're supporting ourselves and getting the support that we need and not just gossiping about the situation. The Disabled Persons Protection Commission, otherwise known as the DPPC, it's an independent state agency and we're responsible for the investigation and the re remediation of instances of abuse committed against adults with disabilities between the ages of 18 to 59 years of age. This is the DPPC hotline. Are you calling to file a report of abuse or neglect? Okay, thank you. Can I get your name? So when reporting an allegation to the Disabled Persons Protection Commission, all reports are, are screened by the staff at the Disabled Persons Protection Commission to see if we have the authority to investigate the abusive situation. 
Also, we have a state police detective unit that's assigned to our office, and every call that's called into the agency is looked at by the state police to determine if there's any elements of a crime. And if there is, it's going to also be investigated criminally as well. So, people who commit crimes committed against persons with disabilities have equal access to the criminal justice system. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, what will happen is we will get this reviewed by supervisory staff here. Uh, there'll be a screening letter sent to you uh, to indicate what happened with the report and how it was screened. And we will get the information sent over to the appropriate service providing agency before the end of the day today. We can often miss abuse because a lot of us don't know what abuse is or don't recognize the abuse or don't recognize the subtle signs of abuse or don't recognize the behavioral changes um, that often comes when someone is a victim of abuse. So by learning how to recognize the indicators of abuse, the signs of abuse, we can do a better job at recognizing abuse and then reporting it. Next we're going to hear from Patty, who is a woman with a disability who is a survivor of sexual violence. When she reported the fact that she was raped by someone she knew, the people around her did not handle the situation well, and that made it even harder for her to heal. My name is Patty Quateri. I work at Mass Advocate Stan Swan. I was living in my mother's father's house in Allenton. Um, I had, I worked at St. Elizabeth Hospital, doing meal room for 40 hours a week and making good money. My boyfriend was taking me to the movies, supposed to, but he took me with this guy house. That night, he took me into his bedroom and just did everything, you know? I mean, well, the rape. And this uh, was someone you knew? Someone I knew. It wasn't pleasant when you knew somebody. But he had a knife on my lap. So I had to call my mother and say, I'll be over uh, my girlfriend's house. So I did that, and then I came home that night. Um, I think it was a Sunday night. I came home, and then about not even 10 o'clock, I think, the police station called. One of the, one of the girls got raped before me, and then she must have called Arlington Police, and I try and get, I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm not talking about it. I can't. So I ran to the bathroom and locked myself in. So my sister knocked the door down and tried and get me, forced me to talk about it. I said, no, 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 no. Finally, 12 o'clock at midnight, they decide to take me down to the police station. They sit me down and then say the story, but it took me like four or five times. I'm getting frustrated. I want to get home. Didn't really want to talk about it anymore because it was getting on my mind. I felt angry because I didn't want to get myself, I was more scared, I think, as much fear off it because then he'll tell me. He told me he'll kill me. That was more like a fear, too. Scared and fear and angry at the same time. I got raped and they, they, I had to go to the group home. And then um, they have these tests you have to take before. I said, can I go back to work? Because I really want to get out. And it will help me to get things out. No, you can't. I would um, feel like victimized, and I feel that I was teaching me like a baby. You know, people you don't have to be like that. When I think about what happened to Patty, I realize that even though somebody did something to hurt her, Patty was the one that was punished. Whether anybody intended this or not, if you look at how people responded to Patty's situation, they took away her choice. They took away her independence. 
Now we may be afraid and want a person with a disability to be safe, and that fear may become greater when somebody has experienced something like rape. But we want to be really careful in our responses to make sure that we're not making people give up their lives just because someone hurt them. And this is why people don't report. Because when we do report, we have a fear that our disability would be used against us and take away what little independence we have. And it's taken away after the incident in the justification of, quote, keeping us safe. This is oftentimes an overreaction as opposed to taking our safety into concern. They're imposing their belief on us because of our disability. So I went to see the therapist for seven years, captain seven years, and she kept things going, mm -hmm. helped me how to solve it and how to control myself. And then she'll help me um, trust people. She helped me to talk to people and help me to socialize again. Patty's doing great today. She currently works at Massachusetts Advocate Standing Strong and she's a member of the Impactability Steering Committee. She also has her own apartment and she lives in the community. Next, we'll see a scenario about a positive, proactive response to a potential abuse situation. I'm Becky Warren. I work in the school to career department as an assistant. And I also work with Impact in there, um, which is the self-defense program that we have here. I had an incident with a driver that, for whatever reason, from the first time I met him, made me uneasy, uncomfortable. Um, he was always kind of suggestive without really saying or doing anything and said a couple of things, asked me to go to the beach with him because it was going to be a nice weekend and would I want to do that? And I said, no, certainly not. Another incident happened where that same ride driver actually came to my house. Hello? Hello, who is it? I asked who it was twice. Um, and didn't hear an answer, but I had thought that it might have been my sister because sometimes she, she doesn't speak loudly enough for me to hear. But I had just seen her, so I figured she came back to bring me something. Hi. Hey. Hi. How's it going? And then I discovered that it was this particular driver, and all kinds of red flags went up, and unfortunately my door is automatic, so it wouldn't close right away anyway. I was in the area and I figured I'd stop by see if you wanted to go get an ice cream or something. He said hi and he was just seeing how I was doing. He was, he was in the neighborhood to visit whatever the person's name was that he made up because that person didn't live there. Uh, I'm, I'm busy actually, I have plans. I'm engaged in this conversation that I don't want to be in with this driver from like my apartment door to the hallway where he's standing, and just very awkward and uncomfortable. Okay. Uh, I mean, don't get the wrong idea. No. Okay. No, we're cool. Okay. He got the message, and then my door after that had just closed. Uh, okay, uh, we'll see you Monday. So it worked out to my advantage, and I most definitely was not going to open it again. I think he might have hung around for a couple minutes. I made sure I stayed inside for maybe 15, 20 minutes after that, just to be sure that he had left. I called my sister and then I called my parents because um, I, I had told them about this driver before. Nothing that had happened, but I just that he made me that uneasy. Um, I explained to them what had happened and then they actually called the police for me because I was just all nerved up. So they called and then the police came by and took, um, and I guess you'd say an incident report. Just because I'm a member of the Triangle staff um, and I use transportation to get here, these situations could happen to anyone. You don't have to be a participant. You don't have to be a person without a disability or with a disability. It, it really doesn't discriminate against any of that. It's, it could happen to anybody. So I would highly recommend equipping yourself with the skills to help keep yourself safe. As you can see in Becky's story, nobody took her humanity away. People who cared and respected Becky heeded her words. They did not presume that her disability 
led her to tell a false story. They did not presume that because she was in that situation, she needed to be isolated and kept away from taking public transportation. They believed her, they trusted her, they supported her in her effort, which is why they had a successful outcome. The important thing is to protect yourself and surround yourself with people that you feel like you can trust and talk to and open up to, whether it's your friends, your parents, your siblings, and just know that you're probably not the first person that has encountered a situation like this, even if it's from a different person, but you can get through it and you'll be fine. Sometimes what happened in Becky's situation is the best that we can do. It was a situation in which her safety was threatened and everyone around her took it seriously, supported her in getting a restraining order, and gave her that support without suggesting she move out of her apartment or give up her independence in any way. But other times we can do more. We can be proactive and prevent abuse before it's perpetrated, before it even gets to the point where somebody is unsafe. And one of the things we can do is focus on our interactions with people with disabilities every day. Do we listen when they express concerns or are we dismissive? When a coworker says something that's disrespectful or potentially emotionally abusive, do we say something? We know this is difficult. We do. But it becomes less difficult when you have an unquestioning commitment to the individual's humanity and dignity. But what happens if it's your boss? Everybody done with their assessment tests? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Pass them on up. Pass them on up. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Excellent. Giselle, why haven't you passed in your paper yet? What's going on? Why aren't you passing it in? I have trouble writing my own name. Trouble writing your name? Yeah. How many times have we gone over this? 100? 200 times? All right. We're all going to have to be late for lunch now because Giselle can't <laughs> pass in her paper because she can't do her name. <laughs> <sighs> Come on, let's do it again. Let's write your name. Go. G. I. Oh my God, you are so slow. E L L E. All right, we're gonna go over this so you get it right. All right, finally, everybody's is here. Let's go to lunch, everybody. Okay. All right, good class today. Have a good lunch. Giselle, are you okay? I'm okay. No, you're not, Giselle. What's wrong? My sister Emily called me and said to me, like, I am a stupid. I don't know. I don't know the thing. So, so. Giselle, that's not right. Teachers should not be doing that to a student at all. It's not right, and you should not be made to feel that is right, because that's not the right thing to do at all. You're not stupid. I know. Nobody should ever make you feel like you are stupid, okay? Okay, thank you. Whoa, hey, you two lovebirds, come on, time for lunch. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can, uh, I'll have that to you probably about 12 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, 12, 12 in the morning I'll have that all ready. Kind of busy today. Uh, yeah, can I uh, call you back? Yeah, I, I get some come up. Thanks. Yeah, uh, John, what's up? Early today, I was doing my work, and all of a sudden, I saw Emily being little, yeah. not so nice to Giselle, like rushing her and making fun of her, like her inability to work fast, trying to hurry along really quick, and so telling what, her to like what hurry was, up. Hurry what was Giselle up, saying though? She was being mean, Giselle. No, Emily was being mean to Giselle. Oh, 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 okay. Uh, Emily, the teacher? Yes. It was probably just a one-time thing. Maybe, I think maybe you're making a bigger deal than this This really is. She was probably just kidding around. I'm sure she is, but um, Giselle was, it, it really upset Giselle, and I don't think that was right at all. Uh, you know, Emily's a, a, a good teacher. I bet this was just a one-time thing. You know, you're probably making a bigger deal than it really is, so I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. But. It might be a, it, it seemed, Sorry. Hey, hey thanks. I'll, I'll, I'll... Hello? Mm -hmm. Giselle! Come on! Please! Help! 
Come on, Giselle. I knew you were slow, but I didn't think you were this slow. Let's go. Oh my God. Scott, Scott, wait a minute. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta see this. Ready? Watch this. It's a race to see who can get out of the bathroom the fastest. And at the start line is Giselle. One, two, and she makes it out in three. Hey, Giselle, how are you? Hey, hey listen, can you come by my office a little bit? Because I want to go over those reports with you. Oh, the reports, sure. And the concert this weekend, too. Oh, for sure. Yeah, let's it's going to be that. awesome. Okay, I'll see you in a little bit, okay? okay. It's good to, see right. you. good to see you, Giselle. All right, talk to you in a little bit. All right, let's go, Giselle. You want to race? Yeah, okay, whatever. Come on in. Hey, Emily. Hey, Scott. How's it going? Hey, it's good to see you. Good to see you, too. Did you have those reports? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I finished them last night, so... Awesome. I mean, I hope I didn't get the dates wrong. Sometimes I yeah, do. Yeah, everything but... looks really good in here. We're well ahead this month. That's awesome. Okay. Great. Cool, I'm glad thanks. to get that for you. Yeah, I also cool. wanted to speak briefly with you about the incident you had with Giselle in the hallway today. What incident was that? Well, I came around the corner and you were banging on the door and making fun of her for not being able to open it quickly enough. And yeah. you were saying it was a race for her to get out of the bathroom. Yeah. And you're banging on the door again and yeah. again. Yeah, she has 10 minutes to go to the bathroom. She's in there for 15 minutes, taking me away from my other 30 students that I have in the classroom. And I just can't have that. She's going to act like a baby. I'm going to treat her like a baby. Well, I can see why it's frustrating. I know you have a lot of responsibility and we have a short staff, but, you know, Talking about the people we serve as babies. I mean, I'm just and, fooling around with her. I fool around with everybody. And if we're ridiculing right. them and calling, talking about... It's not ridicule, though. Like, that's, that's not what I'm doing. Well, Emily, I'm you using... referred to her as a baby just a moment ago. We... That's how... I didn't say she was a baby. I'm saying she's acting like a baby. We can't talk about the people we serve as babies. They're adults, and we're trying to get them ready for employment in the community. And having races to see how fast they can get out of a bathroom and they have a physical disability is really inappropriate. It's not inappropriate. I'm just having fun with her. I mean, she doesn't even know what I'm saying to her anyways. Actually, I think that the Giselle does know what you're saying, and I think it's pretty inappropriate. And, you know, we've talked about this kind of behavior who before. Who are you to come in you... here and tell me what's appropriate, what's not appropriate? I mean, I'm your supervisor. I don't come yeah. into your classroom and be like, oh, hey, Scott, you're not doing the job right. Okay. Well... I, I don't think we see eye to eye on this, and I'm very uncomfortable with it, and I think it's inappropriate, and you know, I don't take any pleasure in this, but I think I'm going to have to talk to HR about your behavior. What? I, mean, I thought you and I were friends, we were cool, and you're going to go run off to HR and talk about my issues that I have with the clients, calling them babies? We are friends, but our mission as an organization is to empower people with disabilities, not treat them with ridicule and treat them as children. And unfortunately, that's what I saw you doing today. This is just not appropriate behavior. I'm sorry to create yeah. a conflict, but we're going to have to do this. Awesome. Yeah, why don't you go talk to HR, and I'll talk to you a little later. Okay. Thanks for getting me in trouble. That's awesome. Let's look at what Giselle and John's lives are like on a daily basis. Emily's dismissive and emotionally abusive while disguising it as humor. When John tries to get support from another staff person, the person puts him off. Imagine how hard it would be to have hope when you're constantly dismissed and disrespected and when people don't listen to you. But the one bright spot in this whole scenario is that Scott said something. We know these kind of conversations are challenging, but they are necessary. Let's look at what Scott did. When he talked to Emily about what happened with Giselle, he was really specific about what she did, about the specific behaviors he was concerned about. And when she started to get defensive, he stood his ground. And he stayed focused on the mission of the organization. And so it couldn't become a confrontation between Scott and Emily. What he did was really brave, especially given the fact that Emily was his boss. So let's think about the organization that Scott's a part of. Does he have the support to say what he said to Emily? Will other people be with him on it? Sometimes in organizations, people do not feel comfortable in having a challenging conversation like Scott, but the secret to making challenging conversations happen is to make sure that your organization is safe so that people don't feel that there's reprisal or that they're going to lose their job or they're going to be stigmatized. That is the difference in making sure that these kind of conversations can happen. Is your organization that kind of organization where people feel safe and secure to have these challenging conversations or is it more about they're worried about protecting themselves because they fear reprisal. There should be never any repercussions for those that report abuse against persons with disabilities or for those that participate in the investigation. And if there are, um, they are protected under our statute. If anyone is retaliated against by their employer 
for uh, making a report to the Disabled Persons Protection Commission or for um, participating in an investigation, they can report, an they can report um, uh, a retaliation complaint to the Disabled Persons Protection Commission and we will investigate that complaint. In the following scene, you will see the interaction between myself as a person with a disability as well as a personal care attendant to show how we interact, either positively or negatively. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, hey. Chuck? Yeah, so if you could put the pants on. Um, Next to the stove, somewhere I can reach them, that'd be great. Yeah, okay. Nope. You put it right up here in the cabinet. <laughs> what? Why are you taking them along? I want to see what's up with the game, see who's winning. Can I have something to drink? There's juice. I just came out of the kitchen. You didn't ask me when I was in the kitchen? Well, I didn't think about it then. Well, you're going to have to wait now because I'm trying to see what's up with this game, see who's winning. I already seen the score, so you need to take a shower so I can go do what I got to do. You going to go take the shower? Well, I'm going to finish my game. I'm not, I'm not ready. You're not ready? Well, you don't got that much time. I got things to do. Fine. All right, let's go. In the scene, you see that the personal care attendant had no respect for the home. There was no knocking. There was a blatant ignoring of wishes. These are the things that personal care attendants must not do because even though they are coming to work, it is still my home or the individual's home. And therefore, those boundaries should not and must not be crossed. Who is it? Chops. Hey, what's going on, man? Not much, man. How you doing today? Chilling, chilling. All right, what you need done? Anything you need done today? Yeah, well, you know, we got the pans in the sink. Do you think you can uh, take them pans and put them next to the stove so I can reach them? Okay, all right then. Yep. Okay, good. All right. Thanks a lot. Yep, you're welcome. Man. Oh. Hey, what's up, man? Oh, I've been playing this game, yo. Did you see that game last night? Nah, I missed it. I was going to ask you what was the score. Oh, I don't even know. Hold, hold on. Let me pause this here. You can, yeah, you can check to see what the score is. Oh, okay, then. So what's going on with you, though? Nothing, nothing. Yo, you think you can give me, um, I think I got some soda in there or something. I get a cup? Yeah, okay. Cool. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Miss. You got your soda, man. Oh, thank you, thank you. You saw that, man? That game was weak. Nah, I didn't catch it all, man. You know, I didn't even catch the score. Oh, thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm going to just finish this up, and then after that, we'll start now, start the shower. Oh, okay, then right. I have it ready for you. Okay, cool. All right. As you can see in this scene, the personal care attendant was quite respectful, paid attention to the wishes and requests made by myself as the person with the disability. That is key. The issue is about respect, about choice, and about maintaining those boundaries that were set within the home. As people without disabilities, it's too easy to think that we know better than a person with a disability, especially for matters involving their own lives and their own personal care. But it's concerning when we do this. Are we limiting someone's life or someone's choices for our own convenience? When we do this, we can make a person more vulnerable to an abuser. If people don't feel like they have agency about their own lives and the most basic daily interactions with people, it can be really hard to resist somebody who's intending to harm them. Therefore, we have to be really careful in all of our interactions to really support the integrity of someone's body, 
to support someone's choices and give them that experience of knowing that their choices and their needs will be listened to. As we've seen, recognizing abuse is sometimes not easy, but it is important. And there are clear-cut steps that all of our organizations can take to make sure that people with disabilities are safe and to be proactive about reporting abuse when they're not. Here are some steps you can take when a person with a disability reports abuse to you. Thank the person for telling you. Even if you're upset or nervous, do your best to project a calm demeanor. If you're in a public or noisy place, ask the person if they want to go to a quiet place to talk. If the person says no, respect that wish and stay where you are. Tell the person you are a mandated reporter of abuse and have to call the Disabled Persons Protection Commission. Give the person the option of being present and participating in the DPPC report. Make a report to DPPC. This information is highly sensitive. If your agency policy requires you to inform your supervisor or anyone else, make sure you communicate that to the person who's reporting. Get permission before you share the abuse report with anyone you are not required to tell. Make sure the person is physically safe. Know who in your agency can help you assess this. If the person has a legal guardian and that guardian is not the alleged abuser, you are required to inform the guardian. Do not talk to the guardian if he or she is the alleged abuser. Know your organization's policy for what to do if the alleged abuser is a member of your staff. If you have questions, doubts, or concerns about the story, do not share your doubts with the person reporting. As a mandated reporter, it's your job to report. It's an investigator's job to investigate. Ask the person if they want referrals to therapy, counseling, or other supports. And finally, take care of yourself. Hearing an abuse report is challenging. Make sure you get the support you need. For more information, please contact these resources. As providers, you sit at the intersection of choice and safety for persons with disabilities. And we hope that this video will help you and your organization realize and recognize the potential for abuse and make sure that your organization is ready and capable to handle that situation.